Today, we're gonna to find out if you're claustrophobic. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please ask the like button to deepen the defensive trench around OP Rock and tell them in exchange, they can take home any of the artifacts they pull out of the ground. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Thirty-three-year-old Nicola Raybon was a nurse who also studied criminology in college. In January of 2012, she was thrilled to move into a new house in Lancashire with her partner John and her two kids. And then later that month, she and her family flew out to the Caribbean island of Antigua to attend her father's second marriage. And while she was excited for her father, she was mostly just excited about the pampering she was going to get from the five-star hotel she was staying in. On the first night they arrived, Nicola went down to the bar to have a couple drinks with her friends. Now, Nicola was not known for being a big drinker or partier. In fact, she was more well known for her work with different charities and for being a really dedicated mother. In fact, one time after her children were named mascots for a local soccer team, Nicola apparently lost sleep. She was so excited for them. After Nicola had a few drinks, her friends said they were going to leave and go to a restaurant to grab some dinner. And they asked her if she wanted to come. And Nicola declined and she said, you know what? I'd rather just go watch the sunset up on the beach. You guys have a good time. After her friends left, Nicola walked up the steps onto the beach, she took her sandals off and took her phone out of her pocket and she put them on a chair and she walked off. Later that night, Nicola's father was supposed to meet up with his daughter, but when he went to their meeting spot, she didn't show up. And so he walked around the hotel asking different guests if they'd seen her and no one seemed to know where she was, but that group of friends that had sat with her at the bar, he found them and they said, oh yeah, she went on the beach to watch the sunset. And so Nicola's father actually smiled to himself because he thought, great, I can go on the beach, find my daughter and finally have a chance to have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her because ever since I got to Antigua, I've been surrounded by guests and I barely had a chance to talk to her. And so Nicola's father walks up to the beach and he looks around and he doesn't see his daughter and it's starting to get dark. So he figures, you know what, I'll give her a call. And so he calls his daughter and she doesn't pick up. And he thinks, okay, she probably just isn't looking at her phone. After that, he called Nicola's partner, John, and he picked up and he said, no, I haven't seen her. The last I heard, I thought she was going to the beach. That's what her friend said. And Nicola's father said, yeah, that's where I am and I can't find her, but I'm sure she's somewhere. And so after he hung up with John, Nicola's father went back into the hotel and he asked Nicola's kids if they had seen her and they said no. And so now feeling a little bit concerned, Nicola's father rounds up a couple of guests to go help him look for his daughter. And so they go up on the beach and one of them quickly discovers Nicola's cell phone and sandals sitting on that chair near the hotel. And so right away, it just seems like this is a big red flag. She's out on the beach. We don't know where she is. She doesn't have her phone. And so now Nicola's father is really worried and he calls the police. Then at some point, as the search party moved farther and farther down the beach, they heard the sound of someone screaming in the distance. And it sounded like a woman and Nicola's father said it sounded like his daughter. Daughter. And so they all start running in the direction of the screaming, but it's so far away and it's so dark that they can't make out who it is or even where they are. And after they ran down the beach a ways, the screaming just stopped. And so they really couldn't figure out who it was. And so everyone's just stumped and overwhelmed by the situation. And for the rest of the night, they just continued to look around the beach and they never found the screaming woman and they never found Nicola. The next morning when the police were still on the beach looking for Nicola and now looking in the hotel as well, the tide went out and that's when they discovered Nicola. After she left the bar, Nicola did go up onto the beach to watch the sunset. And she did it by going down to the water and just walking along the water's edge. And so as she walked away from the resort watching this beautiful sunset, she walked deeper and deeper into the water until she was almost waist deep. And at some point she hit a patch of quicksand and sunk into it. And so she began screaming and yelling for help, but no one could hear her because she was so far away from the resort. And so for hours she sat there as the tide slowly came in and she was just pinned waiting to drown. And then finally, when people realized she was missing and that search party was within earshot of her, it was too late. The water levels were already at her neck. And by the time they actually got up pretty close to her, the water had gone over her head and she drowned. It turned out the search party was basically right next to her. But by the time they got there, she was already underwater, so they couldn't see her. 
Growing up in Oklahoma, Blake Stanfield loved going out in the wilderness with his father, Neil. The pair were more like best friends than father and son, and they spent as much time together as they possibly could. But by the time Blake was in his 30s, he had become a medical doctor, and so he was really busy, and he was married, and he had a young kid, and so he didn't see his father very much. And then in 2003, when Blake was 38, he moved his family to Alaska, and so he really didn't see his father anymore. But shortly after moving, Blake had an idea. He wanted to surprise his dad on his 65th birthday with a rafting trip in Alaska. It was gonna be this great way for the two to reconnect with each other. When he broke the news to his father, Neil was really touched by it and very excited, but at the same time, he was a little bit apprehensive and he asked his son, you know, are we going in a group? Is this gonna be a guided rafting trip? And Blake said, oh no, that's, that's the wrong way to do this. We will not have a good time if we go with a group. We're doing this alone. And so Neil said, well, isn't that a little bit risky, just the two of us out in the middle of Alaska? And Blake said, don't worry, I picked a river that by Alaskan standards is considered leisurely, so we'll be just fine. Neil was still hesitant about it, but the two of them were very competent outdoorsmen, and so ultimately he just went along with it. So later that year, in early July, Blake and Neil took a float plane out to the gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska. This park is totally beautiful, but it's also very dangerous because it's full of grizzly bears and wolves, and it's also very remote. There's no people anywhere near this park. It's basically untouched wilderness. Adding to the isolation and danger, Blake and Neil did not have their cell phones or a radio. It was Blake idea. He said it would be a good idea for us to just totally disconnect and just spend quality time together. And then also Blake had chosen a starting point on this river that was situated basically right in the middle of the park, which meant it was 60 miles away from the nearest human settlement. So after they got dropped off by this float plane and then the captain of that plane took off again, Blake and Neil loaded their stuff into the raft and then they hopped in and they started cruising down this river. At first, their trip was awesome. The weather was perfect. The landscape was beautiful. The water was totally calm and Neil, he might have had reservations about the safety of this trip, but quickly he was overcome with just how, how peaceful it was and how wonderful it was to be with just his son out on the open water. And in fact, Blake had intentionally booked this trip two weeks before the start of the official rafting season in Alaska, which meant really there was nobody else in the water. It was just those two. And they thought, wow, what luck except it turns out there's a very specific reason why the rafting season starts when it does in Alaska, because that's the earliest the ice melts in the river and it becomes safe to travel on. After two hours of peace and tranquility out on this river, Blake and Neil started to notice these large ice chunks in the water ahead of them. And they were easy enough to get around, but as they kept moving, the current was picking up and these ice chunks got bigger and bigger until they started being these huge sheets all across the edges of the river where there was only a narrow strip of water they could travel through. And at some point, Neil asked Blake if it would be a good idea to just pull the raft over to the side of the river and get out and reassess the situation and see if we've reached a anomaly in the river where just this section is frozen, or if this is gonna continue for a lot farther. And if so, we need to make alternative plans here. But Blake was not having it. He was stubborn, he wanted to keep going, and he was convinced he could maneuver the boat around the ice. And he said, let's just keep going a little bit farther. And so when they went a little bit farther, they reached a point where the current was so strong that they could no longer get out of the river. They had to ride it like a rapid until it stopped. And so as the father and son are fighting with each other about not having gotten out of the river while they still had a chance, they were not paying attention to what was in front of them. And they came around a corner and there was this huge ice shelf that was right across the whole river that basically blocked the whole path. And they turned at the last second. They couldn't do anything either way, but the nose of the raft went directly under the ice shelf and it flipped the raft onto its side, dumping Neil and Blake into frigid Alaskan waters underneath the ice shelf. And Blake would later say that he really believed that this was it. He didn't know how far this ice shelf was gonna go on for. And so he assumed, I'm about to drown but they managed to hit this air pocket inside of this ice shelf. The ice basically formed up at a bow and they both happened to pop up into it and they gripped onto the ice. And they're looking at each other and they have no idea how long this ice shelf continues, but the current is pulling them and they know it's just a matter of time before they get sucked under and go back under the ice. And so they look at each other and they don't really know what to say, but it's kind of obvious that they think they're about to drown. And then at some point, Neil gets sucked under and swept away and then Blake falls follows shortly after. And then fortunately, they only tumbled along for about 10 or 15 more feet before they popped up again. But much like the boat that could not paddle out of the river because of how strong the current was, 
Blake and Neil could not get out of the river in time before they hit yet another ice shelf. And the next ice shelf was much longer than the first. And so they knew it was gonna happen. They grabbed onto the ice shelf and they're holding on and they're trying to pull themselves back out, but the current's too strong. And at some point they each had to take a big breath and then let go and got pulled directly under the ice. And so the whole time they're pressing their face up against the underside of this ice in hopes they find an air pocket, but they don't. And so the whole time they're just desperately looking for air and they're bumping into the underside of the ice. They have no idea how long it's gonna go on for. And so after what felt like an eternity, Blake finally gets shot out the backside of this huge ice shelf and he's still in the river, but there's no more ice shelves in front of him and the current had slowed down a little bit. So he was able to make his way to the edge and get out of the water. And he turned to face the water and his dad was nowhere to be found. And so Blake turns and he doesn't see his father coming out of the ice. He doesn't know if he's still under, if he came out again. And so he turns and runs downstream in hopes that he might have come out already. And sure enough, he found his dad clutching a rock in the middle of this river farther up. His head was badly bleeding, but he was alive. And so Blake grabbed a stick and was able to bring his father back into shore. Even though they had survived being pulled under the ice, they now had no equipment, no gear, no food, no water, no anything, because it was pulled under the water. And they were soaking wet and becoming hypothermic. And they're in the middle of nowhere with no one nearby to help them. And no one's expecting them for a week. And no planes are gonna be in the area for two weeks. Fortunately, Blake had a lighter in his pocket that worked. And so they were able to start a fire and stay warm. And they were able to scare away grizzly bears and wolves. Blake finally walked away from their campsite, which was up on a mountain. And he went down to this river where he was able to flag down a float plane that was not even scheduled to be in the area. It was just totally random. And they saw Blake, they came back, they picked him up and both men were just fine. They did say that even though the trip was a complete disaster and nearly killed both of them, it did reconnect them in a way that few things could and their relationship is good as ever. But they both say they will never go rafting again. On July 10th, 1941, a brand new British submarine was commissioned called HMS Umpire. Nine days later, on July 19th, the submarine and her crew were told to meet up with a convoy moving north along the Medway River in England and make their way to Scotland. So Umpire joined up with the convoy, but then they started having engine problems that night and they began drifting back behind the convoy until they were basically not in the convoy anymore at all. During this time, the commander of the submarine was up in the bridge, which is the area that controls the submarine when it's above surface, just above the wing. The captain of the umpire was concerned this convoy would not see them when they came through because they were a submarine. So they're sitting low in the water and they're already all dark. They have no lights on the outside on purpose because this was during World War II and they didn't want German ships or planes to spot them. And because of their engine problems, they had drifted away from their convoy, which would have been protection. So the captain decides to deviate from their course to get the submarine clearly out of the way of this convoy. And so when he started turning the submarine, the steering broke, leaving the submarine now turned so its entire side is now facing this convoy and they were still drifting directly towards this convoy. And so sure enough, before the captain could do anything, one of the larger ships struck the side of the submarine, immediately flooding their forward torpedo room. And for a brief second, the submarine and the ship were kind of mangled together. And then it slipped off the ship and it sunk all the way to the bottom, 18 meters down. The captain, along with the other three men that were up on the bridge with him when they were struck, they managed to leap out at the last second and were treading water when this all happened. As for the other 34 crew members, they were stuck inside when it sunk. A number of the crew had been sleeping at the time of the crash. And so all they felt was this crash, the power goes out, they leap out of their beds and they're landing in waist deep water. And they're running out into the halls, kind of fumbling around because they can't see anything. And all they can hear is the sound of water pouring inside of their submarine. And so these sailors had gone through all sorts of drills to prepare for this type of scenario where, you know, power's out and you're sinking. And so they know by touch how to get to the one area that has an escape hatch, which is the engine room. And after 20 of them, got inside the engine room, the water levels in the hallway were getting so high that it was spilling into that room. And it was getting to the point where if they didn't seal the door, they were gonna flood this one room that was their only chance of survival. And so they had to make the heartbreaking decision to lock and seal that door, meaning the 14 other sailors on the other side, if they hadn't already died, were now condemned. 
But for the 20 men who now were gonna be able to use this escape hatch, there was no guarantee that would work because to use the escape hatch on a submarine, you need to understand how it works. You can't just open a hatch on a submarine. It won't open. The pressure from the seawater presses down on it to where it literally cannot open. You might be able to open it a crack if you use a tool, but that's about it. In order to open the escape hatch, you need to use something called a lockout chamber. And so a lockout chamber is like this really tight claustrophobia inducing thing that looks an awful lot like a gas chamber where you step through one hatch and you shut it and you seal it so it's watertight. And then above you is your escape hatch, but you can't open it until the pressure inside of the chamber has been equalized. And the way they do that is they flood the inside of the chamber the escapee is in. And so you're standing inside of this tight space, totally sealed sealed in and there's a control panel inside the chamber itself and also inside the sub if you're lucky enough to have someone do that for you. You turn on the chamber at which point water is dumped inside of this tight space you're in until it's completely full and you're holding your breath at which point you've now equalized the pressure inside the chamber is equal to that outside and you can actually open the hatch. So the person inside on a breath hold undoes the hatch, opens it up, and then hopefully your swim isn't too far because you're already on a breath hold and you swim to the surface. And during World War II, submariners were outfitted with a special piece of equipment if they ever needed to leave via the escape hatch. And it was their Davis escape gear, which is basically this life jacket that's uninflated. And when you manually activate it, it suddenly inflates. And so when you go through that hatch, you would activate it and it would assist you to get to the surface. And so after those 20 sailors had decided to seal off the engine room, Room, they immediately shifted focus and began getting guys into the escape hatch. And one of their most junior sailors, a guy by the name of Killian, said he would stay inside the room and operate the control panel so everybody else had the best chance of getting out of the escape hatch. And so sure enough, he put all 19 into the hatch and he got them out of the submarine. And then he, on his own, had to get in the hatch, seal it himself and control the panel in total darkness, flood the space, open it up and shoot to the surface. He would live and he would be awarded the British Empire Medal for bravery. One junior officer named Edward Jones was one of the 14 men that did not get to the engine room before they sealed it off. And when he got there and realized the situation, he turned around and looked down the hall and there were only three other men that were standing there. And he didn't know how many had made it in the engine room. He figured this was the only four that had not made the cut. But in fact, there was actually 10 other people that were just stuck in various places inside of the submarine. But Jones decided he only had these guys in front of him. And so he said, hey, come with me. I have an idea. As Jones led them down this hallway, the water levels had risen up to their necks and all these circuits on the walls were starting to spark all around them. And so Jones led them to the middle of the submarine and then he turned and went up into the control room. And then from the control room, he went even farther up into what's called the conning tower. The conning tower is a submarine's main attack center. It's where you have those periscopes they look around in and it also has the firing buttons for their torpedoes. It is not designed to be an escape hatch because once you flood the conning tower, there's no control panel like there is on an escape hatch to drain the water that was used to equalize in order to open the hatch. So once the water's in, it's either you get to the surface or you drown. Also, in order to exit out of the conning tower, you need to go through this very narrow tube that goes straight up and it's got a ladder through it that can barely fit one person climbing up, meaning the people at the bottom of the ladder will have to hold their breath a lot longer than the people at the top. So Jones and the other three sailors, they get to the conning tower and they seal the hatch at their feet. So blocking the hallway flood from coming into where they are. And they realize that even though they have to do this, there are no other alternatives here that realistically one or two or more are gonna die in the process of just trying to get out of the submarine. But it was all they could do. So they made peace with their decision. They climbed up and they opened the hatch just enough to let water come in, but quite a bit started coming in. The men wedged themselves as high up in the tunnel as they possibly could, but obviously not everybody could get all the way up to the hatch. And so two were down low and Edward Jones and one other were up towards the top. And Jones would say that at first they were talking and praying. And then when they started feeling the water get closer and closer to their heads they went silent and then Jones remembers keeping his hand on the one man that was below him and when his hand was wet he knew the two men below him were completely submerged and then the water came up to his face covered his head and at that point he opened it up and they swam out. Of the four men in the conning tower only Edward Jones and the other guy who was high up in the tunnel with him made it to the surface. All told, only 14 of the 38 total crew survived the accident. 
So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please tell the like button to deepen the defensive trench around OP Rock. And you can tell them that in exchange for their work, they can keep any of the artifacts they dig up out of the ground. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me you can direct message me on instagram or on twitter my username for both platforms is the same it's john ballin 416 i also have a ton of content over on tiktok where my username is mr ballin if you have a story suggestion please submit it to our subreddit just called mr ballin it's linked in the description below so whether i see you on twitter instagram tiktok reddit youtube or some combination just know that i really appreciate your support and until next time that's going to do it see ya